I'm joined today by Adam Crowther. He's a researcher at Public Citizen, also author of the report A Rising Tide, which looks at outside influence uh, as a result of the 2010 Supreme Court decision on Citizens United. Adam, really great to have you here. You know, after the initial Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, there were kind of opposing views, one which said that this decision was just going to lead to more freedom and liberty for everybody, and it would be really, really great. And another view, which was a, a, a concerned view, that this was actually going to be a real problem in terms of outside influence into electoral politics, lobbying, etc. We now have several years of data as part of your report. What does the data say about what the results have been? I, mean, I think the data are pretty clear at this point. I think we're seeing a couple emerging trends. One is that uh, wealthier and wealthier individuals are spending more and more on politics and that the vehicles they're using to spend on politics were largely enabled by the Citizens United decision in 2010. Um, two of the biggest sor sources of spending right now are 501c4 groups and super PACs. And super PACs were com completely enabled by Citizens United. Uh, they were a political committee that did not exist prior to 2010. Um, 501c4s existed, um, but they had some more restrictions on how they could spend and the sources of the money that they could spend. And Citizens United also made it a little bit easier uh, for corporations to funnel money into those two groups. Um, so really, I think the jury isn't really out anymore. I think the jury's come back and they sort of said that uh, Citizens United has had a pretty pervasive influence on how much money is being spent on our elections. Can you highlight one or two of the most particularly egregious cases maybe that you talk about in the report of specific races where as a result of the 2010 decision, money that would not otherwise have been allowed was allowed? Or, or what are some of the interesting stories that you came across? I, mean, I think one of the one that sort of jumps off the paper a little bit is um, the Boston mayoral election um, that just occurred. And the field was all Democrats. The way their system works is there's uh, no affiliation in the primary and the top two go on to the general. Um, but there was a huge amount of outside spending, and primarily by super PACs. Um, prior to Citizens United, Massachusetts state law um, prevented contributions to political committees of more than $500 by individuals. And so there were really tight constraints on who could give and who couldn't give. Um, Post-Citizens United in Massachusetts, you sort of see a loosening of the purse strings, and it makes it a lot easier, and, and in this case it was organized labor, um, to put big money into some of these campaigns. Uh, another one where you see sort of surprising influences was in North Carolina, um, and it was a, so a state Supreme Court race. Um, and this is a little bit concerning because you sort of see big money getting into judicial elections and the repercussions it might have for how judges want to rule on certain cases. Um, and you had a, currently there's a general election in November, but we, what we looked at was spending in the primary, which occurred earlier this year. Um, and there was over $1.2 million in spending by outside groups. Um, many of which received corporate donations. Um, so you see that you know, Citizens United is impacting races at all levels. You have local mayor races, you have state Supreme Court races. Um, another couple of the cases we looked at, we saw local school board elections, we saw state Senate races. Um, and so the money is everywhere at this point. Um, it's really unregulated and it's seemingly limitless. The Massachusetts example is really interesting, and our program up until a year ago was based in Massachusetts. That's where it started. That's where I lived for, for 20 or so years. It's very interesting because on the one hand, those who liked the Citizens United decision said that the decision allows for more freedom and liberty and people to do what they want with their money. At the same time, a lot of those advocates of so-called freedom and liberty often point to states' rights as a bastion of freedom and liberty. And here's a very specific case, as you said, where the state law was superseded by this decision. So it actually, in a sense, is a, an elimination or a limiting of state freedom, is it not? So that's exactly right. I think you hit on sort of one of the central tensions um, that we tried to highlight in the report, and it's that there are 20 states that had some type of ban on unlimited corporate or individual expenditures on state elections. Uh, we didn't categorize them all in a specific way, but in 20 states, there was some restriction. And after Citizens United, you have the laws of these states invalidated or undermined or overturned. And the result is you have people who say that unlimited spending is good because, you know, there's individual freedom, personal liberty, freedom of speech. Um, but they're the same people who are also trumpet states' rights. And so you really can't have it both ways. 
Uh, and so I think you, you really need to hit the nail on the head and that there's conservative arguments for one and the conservatives try to make the same argument for the other. And it kind of feels like they're, they want to have it both ways. Practically speaking, as we look at the 2014 election and then eventually the 2016 election, what are the specifics of how this 2010 Citizens United decision may impact those elections? Well, I think what you're seeing right now in the 2014 cycle is massive amounts of outside spending. Um, I think there was a recent news story that said that outside spending, and particularly by 501c4 groups, in the 2014 cycle, which is a midterm cycle, you, you typically expect less spending um, during these midterm elections than you would uh, during a presidential uh, cycle, that they expect the 2014 spending to rival that of the 2012 election. Hmm. And the 2012 election sent records of every stripe. Uh, it, you name it, and it broke it. Um, so the fact that we have a midterm election coming up where outside spending could potentially rival that of a 2012, elec the 2012 election, um, you know, I think the word could be frightening. It's disturbing. It's certainly alarming um, that there's that much money getting into politics right now. I like to uh, try to give our audience suggestions for how to talk about these issues with people they know in their everyday lives. And I'm curious, what would you say? In other words, let's say you were ha we were having this conversation with someone who thinks the Citizens United decision was great. And they say to us, OK, so there's a lot of outside spending. But who cares? Why is that bad? In other words, why is it objectively a negative thing that people are allowed to spend money uh, who may not be constituents? What are what's the best way for people to push back against that? I think there's a couple of ways to approach it. Um, I think the first that I might take is you have to think about who's really involved in elections, who's actually giving. And predominantly, it's the wealthy the really wealthy and the extremely wealthy. Um, and particularly when you talk about outside spending, you're talking about folks that are extremely wealthy and have their own set of interests at play. Um, mm. Talk about how engaged the Koch brothers are in elections. Um, and they have a very specific anti-tax deregulatory agenda that they want to see pushed forward. And so they're pumping big money into the elections. And so you have to wonder, is, are these really wealthy individuals, are their values really consistent with the values of an everyday voter? Are the policies they're interested in pursuing consistent with the policies that the everyday voter is interested in? And I'm not sure that those, those always align. And so I think that you want to approach a person who may think that this is a great thing and sort of say, you know, what do these people really believe in? What do you really believe in? You know, do you think it's fair that they're able to influence the system um, so disproportionately? Uh, and really approach it, I think, from uh, an inequality perspective and in that they're able to sort of drown out the voices of everybody else. Very, very interesting stuff. I encourage everyone to check out the report, A Rising Tide from Public Citizen. We've been speaking with Adam Crowther, who's a researcher at Public Citizen and author of that report. Adam, thanks a lot for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.